Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to another panel uh, of the International Online Theatre Festival at the theatertimes.com 2021 festival. Uh, today, we're talking about multilingual theatre making during the pandemic, and we have four wonderful guests uh, with us. We have uh, Caridad Speech, nomadic Cuban, Argentinian, Spanish, Croatian, multi-awarded playwright whose The Book of Magdalene is still screened at the festival. We have Tatiana Prati, the artistic director of the Theater Company, one of the oldest Dutch uh, companies, Frisian language uh, company, whose uh, Nacht, she was a co-director, uh, was also streamed on uh, our festival. We have Anna Bayat, multilingual storyteller, author and actor behind the uh, autobiographical and multilingual show Mimi Suitcase, and Lara Parmiani, UK-based Italian theatre maker, the artistic director of Legal Aliens, and also one of the co-founders of Migrants in Theatre movement that emerged during pandemic. Hello, welcome. Hello. Thank Hi. you so much <laughs> for, for joining us. So my first question is, we talk about multilingualism and so much, not everything, of course, but so much of multilingualism, multilingual theater making is connected to that privilege of movement. And in many ways, your work, Kari, that you are nomadic playwright, you call yourself nomadic playwright, uh, Tatiana Frisian uh, Theater travels all over Friesland to perform. Anna, all your show, like the Mimi Suitcase, is about being able to travel. Lara, your work grows out of the privilege of movement. You work with migrant artists in, in applied context, as well as in, in uh, theater, professional theater making. How has the pandemic and when that privilege of movement was taken away, how has that affected your multilingual theater making? Carry that, maybe you want to start. Sure. Um, I've been thinking about this. I mean, I feel like the digital space, you know, I know that we're, we're in one right now <laughs> from all over the world, uh, almost. And, uh, and what I would say is that it's a space that I've always been interested in since about the year 2000 uh, from a theatrical perspective. Uh, and, and I, I had done a couple of experiments with, um, you know, actors in different countries beaming in to do work and collaborating internationally. And suddenly it felt like, oh, this is a kind of movement. And I think that um, it, it relies on Wi-Fi access, <laughs> which is another problem that we need to talk about. But I feel like on one level, it sort of made movement easier. Um, and it also made uh, dialogues and collaborations uh, and, and even the beginnings of conversations with other artists uh, slightly easier um, than before, uh, because suddenly it wasn't about touring something or like physically touring something or uh, trying to install work uh, in a venue. Uh, and so I found it strangely, I hate to say this, but strangely liberating <laughs> um, and, uh, and kind of um, like a, a, a view, maybe a window, I should say, into, you know, we we're talking about this earlier uh, before the panel began, but a little bit into what it's preparing us for in terms of the world of climate change, which is we're in it. Uh, and actually, this is sort of like the way forward. And, and I think that uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not dissing uh, in-person work or, or work that's happening in locations uh, and work that's hyper-local. But, but I am saying that this is a, these are spaces that are available to us, hopefully, in some regard, and that they're allowing for a different kind of movement to occur. And also what I would say is a different kind of movement in terms of the dramaturgy of the work that's being created, uh, which for me is the most exciting uh, part of this. Thank you. Lara? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say about this. Um, first of all, a little bit like Carida, for 
quite a few years, uh, I have been trying to talk to people, especially like organizations like the Arts Council, about the idea of rethinking international um thinking yeah especially you know with climate change obviously we're talking pre-covid um how can we create international theater by actually exploiting the international artists that already live in one country so uh do we always need to fly people in or fly people out can we uh first of all start by looking at our communities and i'm talking specifically of the uk uh that is such you know there is everyone here and uh, all these everyone's and very often not represented so uh why don't we start making international theater by actually start hiring and giving voices and giving platform to people from all over the world who are already here so that is something that especially with covid plus uh climate change it, it's definitely something that i really invite the arts council and funders and people to to really really think about because i think they're really missing out on uh, on a on an incredible uh, kind of source of uh, of energy of new ideas that is actually there and in that sense that's why migrants in theater happened uh we really kind of got the time because of the pandemic stopping everything to get together and to create a mass because i think it's important to to actually make people realize that in the uk we are not talking about like a few people here and there that's the numbers are huge and so you know all and we all shared like the, the core members and then when we talk to all the other uh, theater makers who joined us this kind of sense of feeling invisible of not having platforms and uh, and actually there's so much that we can offer because which is something that really we try to say obviously we reclaim spaces but also we reclaim spaces because we have so much to offer and and and, and, and so i think that is something important that came out of of of, uh, of lockdown this kind of uh, new discourse around different ways to think, uh, to rethink international. Uh, equally, obviously at the beginning, I kind of panicked because uh, working with people from all over the world when the pandemic started, I lost all my ensemble all of a sudden because people were struggling to survive and many people decided, and they thought at the time it would be a month or two and we nobody expected this this thing to last for over a year um you know people just went back to live with their parents back home uh, because in, especially london is so expensive that and and a lot of people with kind of uh, hybrid status you know pre-settled status all those things that lovely things happening with brexit we're not quite sure whether they would be entitled to a, any government help for instance so a lot of people, a lot of people in my ensemble, at least temporarily, went back to their countries. And I thought, okay, that's the end of the company. But which is why actually we then found a way to do this digital pro project, to do things I'm not, which is a podcast, but not in a traditional way, uh, to, to kind of try and find a way to still be creative, to still uh, write and act and 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 create platforms from migrant for migrant voices, but from a remote kind of uh, situation. And I think it was quite interesting to see how all this was possible, how you could record from, I mean, like how you can exploit technology in a way that really can help the arts. Because there's so much free technology, you know, what we're doing now on, 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 on Zoom and stuff like that, you know, there's so much access to technology that really should be exploited as much as possible and nothing, really obviously being in the in a physical space is a completely different experience but for instance like my associate is still um kind of still in the czech republic at the moment and uh and I, i'm in london and we are doing a mini r d in our front rooms <laughs> so we've given we've given some tasks uh and that is going to be a physical thing but you know we read some steps uh, and each of us in our front room you know on zoom i'm gonna try and create and we're gonna kind of uh, uh comment on each other and give each other feedback and i never tried that before but it's uh yeah it's an experiment and let's see what happens with it thank you tatiana yeah um well there's a lot that's been said um 
I think uh, for us, we are in a bit in a different situation because we work hyper local, um, always in our province with the people and the stories of uh, Friesland. Um, so what is new for us now is that we can show it all over the world because of COVID, because we would never have done that before. Um, what I recognize from what Lara says is that um, it's a, uh, it's good to be more aware of how we travel and how we, when we really need it. I remember going to Moscow for a day for a festival and it felt really bad being in the airplane for one day. And um, well, maybe we can organize those things in a totally different way in the future. Hopefully we will think about it in a different way. Um, yeah, I don't know, that's about it. No, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Anna? Sure. Um, well, I had an, an interesting experience because the last performance of Mimi's suitcase here in San Francisco was um, literally right before sh uh, theater shut down and the pandemic became more of a known, known thing. And so that was in January of 2020. And one thing that happened that I think now was fortuitous was that uh, we filmed it professionally without knowing that that may come to substitute the in-person touring that, that, that I had envisioned um, following getting a matching grant for it to tour the US. Um, and so right now what's happening is that we have this um, you know, professionally uh, shot and edited film um, or, or rather the filming of the dress rehearsal and um, because the show has three or four languages in it, you know, we also then it was a lot easier or not easier, but in terms of visibility to then, um, because in the, in the live performance, we had super titles, but now we have subtitles um, in the film format. And so in thinking about, you know, multilingual theater in that, in that sense, um, you know, I now have something with which I can then uh, perhaps go in and seek opportunities, you know, to reach broader audiences, um, you know, either, either returning to the fringe this year, you know, remotely, or uh, another thing that I have in mind is an academic tour or festivals that would welcome stories of immigration and women's stories and uh, multilingual stories. And so in that sense, just like uh, Caridad and Lara said, um, it, it has, you know, that is one of the upsides of mm. the current situation that I have observed. And of course, that would never take the place of in person because it's, it's just nothing like that, uh, you know, being the experience of being in the same room. And it really doesn't have to substitute that. I mean, we could have that. And then <laughs> alongside it, of course, you know, live theater could continue perhaps in a different format. And But I also have noticed... Um, just generally through life experience and observing what history does when it repeats itself is that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of creativity or fortunately, but I'm just saying, unfortunately, because, you know, through, um, you know, hardships, we often find new ways of doing mm -hmm. things. So meaning it's not the easy way, but it's true that, that that does happen, that we find creative ways of doing things that perhaps in the past was not acceptable. Yeah, which is also true of self-tape you know maybe maybe four years ago they would be like well if you're not in LA then forget it and you'd say well can't I self-tape no and now you do you mm -hmm. do do your own taping whether it's for voice or or image mm -hmm. um, and um, just another thing that I've, I've observed is that you know the idea of radio play in this day and age where we could perhaps, you know, record, or as Lara was saying, you know, people are in different countries and then we can um, actually have a session in which uh, everybody's participating and it's being recorded with high quality. So radio mm. plays another thing that's very much on my radar because it then lends, it lends itself to um, even, even more of a reach globally. Yes, so uh, I was thinking, Anna, when I was watching Mimi, uh, you have that line, we could be anywhere now. And I was thinking, this is really about the pandemic theater experience, we could be anywhere. But you, you also raised something 
all of you in many ways that physical experience um, is something very different than you know than making theater virtual. And I guess, well, from my experience, and this is just of course only mine uh, in multilingual theater making in particular. So much decisions arises from misunderstandings in rehearsal. Somebody used different language. It's that it's that language interactions that is happening that is very much embodied, um, and things that go wrong. Um, so I wonder how has how has that specifically affected the creative processes in terms of languages you are involved in, or it hasn't. <laughs> Anyone that wants to answer. Sure, I'll go. Um, you know, it really depends because, for example, I mean, in my case, um, you know, I was born in Iran, but I grew up in Barcelona. I attended a French school and then I studied in London for eight years. So, and I've been in the US for 20. So, for me, um, whatever I carry, whether it's in the style of speaking or gestures, I love what you just said about, you know, could that, could that lead to misunderstandings, right? Um, and so for me as a multilingual and multicultural person where I cannot possibly put myself in a box because I really belong to all the cultures that I've experienced. Um, I have noticed that, for example, um, you know, in this day and age, perhaps, uh, you know, being assertive, particularly for women, it might be frowned upon. You know, you, it might be sort of like, oh, you know, that was too direct or something mm -hmm. like that. Or I might find an interaction that is far too harsh and direct, sort of a little scary because maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you know, maybe I, maybe I favor more of a flowery language. Maybe I'm more um, about um, sort of um, using kindness first or mm -hmm. using flowery language. So, uh, and then you're right that gestures can, can vary dramatically from from culture to culture um, and and of course every time we, we switch a language the body language also changes doesn't it you mm -hmm. know if i'm speaking spanish my shoulders are constantly working i don't know this that but maybe when i'm speaking in english my shoulders are, are more relaxed um, so i'd be curious to see what experiences anyone else has had with with this topic i if i can say um I've encountered those kind of issues more with our community group. Uh, so we are we are trying to devise a show with our community group. So there's it's non-professionals and they are refugees and migrants from literally all over. And I think for those kind of people um, that have never acted in English uh, before, it is you, you do encounter a lot of a misunderstanding because in the real space somebody could just say to their friend who speak the same language you know what 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 did they say and they and the translation is kind of that mm. happening on on the side uh it, 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 it could also probably happen even with a with a professional group I don't know but I think it's those kind of side conversations that sometimes uh you know mm. on the, in, in on, on zoom there's always this kind of people have to, to, to speak one at a time. And, and, and that makes it all kind of, it makes it reductive. Or if you are trying to do, rehearse something where maybe you want maybe somebody to speak in English and somebody to speak at, in another language, almost at the same time, it's almost impossible. I think it's a question of like, uh, the, 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 there is a kind of a messy, uh, creativity that happens in rooms where when people talk at the same time or, or kind of you mm -hmm. know improvise something that on zoom everything has to be so clearly defined no now you speak now you speak that it becomes really um sometimes there's some beautiful moments that happen out of mess and i think the mess on zoom is so messy that it kind of becomes difficult so i think probably that is uh is is something that, that is much harder that kind of uh sudden genius of somebody coming up with something that uh it's a mix between english mm. and another language that in the room can really be come yeah it, it, it can be easier also to identify sometimes even if you're the one on, on who's kind of directing it and and tries to to, to kind of oh, what what are you doing uh so yeah, that's, uh, I think that's what has mm. happened in our sessions. 
Tatiana, I guess that must be completely different for you because that that nacht rehear like how you rehearse it, it, how how was the rehearsal process affected by the COVID in theater? Well, we were going to make the play on a parking um, arena. That was the idea, but uh, also some we already some weeks before COVID came. Uh, my brother is in the World Health Organization, so he told me about this pandemic coming and I was prepared for it. So I already thought about everything that was going to happen and uh, how to change it. So we were able to make a lot of live theater, but in different ways. And um, well, we had, I think, 36 plans for Nacht. And at the end, we chose for this one because I really wanted, because we were a bit further in the pand pandemic and I wanted to have a live element in our play, um, but also look for a different way of approaching uh, storytelling. Um, so we, we found this new way of also yeah, starting online and at the end, getting somebody in front of your door. So there were 10 actors that every night played for uh, five uh, houses in front of five houses and people first watched an online um, yeah uh, uh, short movies from uh, what what keeps people awake and then at the end they got a got an actor at their home so we had to make a movie and we had to make uh, the monologues uh, but it was amazing because we all loved being together and working together and all the languages it was all fine because uh, we don't have like really different languages Frisian Dutch Leewater, it's all, yeah, you can understand each other. So sometimes we have to help each other a little bit to understand well, but it was all okay. So it's something totally different. It feels like I should not talk here. <laughs> no, that's, that's, this is, you know, uh, I think it's about that your audience has that receptive strategy that they can understand without understanding everything. They are, yeah, they are used to our theater and uh, we always make um, theater in more languages because we want to represent everyone who is living in Friesland and that are a lot of people. So we choose for what language we work in um, with every play we make. That's yeah. amazing. Caridad, what is it for a playwright? Because that, that, you oh. know, it's a different story, I guess. <laughs> It is a different story. I mean, I, I feel like for me, the uh, I feel like I'm being the optimist here during a very dark time. So forgive me for being so optimistic. But, um, uh, you know, with the Book of Magdalene specifically, um, you know, I, I wrote it during the lockdown, really at the height of lockdown. Um, and it's a play I've been thinking about for a while and had kind of been putting off. And then, uh, you know, suddenly I had eight shows cancel and, <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll just write whatever I want. Uh, and, um, and then we, it was very strange. I sent it to Main Street Theater in Houston, who is a theater I worked with before, just out of, Really, it was just kind of whimsical, I think. I, I sent it to them and I expected nothing. I was just like, hey, I'm working on this and what do you think? And uh, Becky Odin, who's the artistic director there said, I wanna do this and I wanna do this now. And I was like, what? But we're in a pandemic, how is this gonna happen? You know, and she was like, we'll figure it out. We have to have this, I wanna do this now. We can't just sit and wait. And I was like, well, that's my energy, right? I love like not sitting and waiting and actually making things happen. And and so, so literally, you know, I think one of the strategies around that show was, uh, and this was Amelia Rico, the director, you know, uh, something that we talked about and that she was really interested in was that it would be filmed on stage, but it wouldn't be like seeing the production on stage. It's actually a film of a stage event. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So it was shot like a film. So out of sequence, uh, you know, uh, with with the set, with the costumes, with all those things, uh, and then assembled, uh, edited, but still capturing something of the theatricality of it being like hearing footsteps on a stage floor and all those things. Uh, and, and also what I call the rough magic of physical theater. Um, and so uh, I've, I found like a really, that a really interesting lens uh, by which to view the play, because I also think the play could work, you know, I say in the, for those of you who don't know it, uh, uh, we're not familiar with it. Uh, I will say that on the front of the play, I talk about it being 
it can live in different ways. It can live as a digital piece or as an audio piece or uh, many other ways of thinking about the piece. And um, and it was written intentionally that way. And and so so I was like, oh, you know, in my head, I thought we were just going to treat this as a purely digital event. Uh, but this combination of so you talk about languages, and I would say, well, there is a language of film, mm. <laughs> which is a language. Uh, certainly for actors, performing to the camera is different than performing uh, live in front of an audience, um, even live in front of no audience. <laughs> uh, and there's also performing on Zoom is not the same as performing for a camera. Uh, it's a different thing. So I think that, you know, and I've experienced all of those things times 10 during the pandemic. Like I've done, I've had three premieres, uh, all productions made during the pandemic. One of them actually four, one of oh, five, I'm sorry, I'm counting them in my head. One of them was on Zoom. One of them was shot on four different stages, uh, performed live, but with also pre-recorded elements. Another one was performed live and shot like just a pro shot production. Uh, one of them was a green screen show. Uh, so I've experienced like a gamut of different, la literally languages of articulation mm. uh, on stage, uh, which I found super fascinating. And I will say, I know that surtitles is going to come up. So what I will say is that I absolutely love surtitles. So um, one of the one of the problems that I that I at least here in the United States, I will say that captioned performances are are kind of like um, you get them once in a while. <laughs> it's, you know, in a run at a show, oh, there's two performances that have like captioning or signing or like whatever, you know, and I'm just like, why can't they all be captioned? You know, I feel like, who are we missing? Who are we leaving out of the mm -hmm. equation when that happens? Um, and so one of the things that's happened during this time in terms of at least work made digitally is that this option comes to the forefront. It's like, well, we can do it. What is the, you know, what is the software that we're gonna use? Um, and it gives a kind of access, uh, which I really, I actually really appreciate. Um, and I'm going to, I feel like I'm missing it already. I went to see something live the other day and I was like, but where are the captions? <laughs> I want the captions, please bring them back. Uh, even though it was in English, you know what I mean? Like there's just something around, I think it's probably my own fascination with seeing text on a screen uh, and actually just being able to look at the language. And sometimes the surtitles are from the author and sometimes they're created by somebody who's creating mm -hmm. surtitles. And that's a very different kind of translation exercise. But, um, but I'm fascinated by that. And it's also becomes like a parallel from a, from a formal level. I'm interested in the idea that you're, that if it's text-based work, that the text is sort of living in this space mm -hmm that can live kind of weirdly, I know that sounds strange, but weirdly independently of what you're watching. You know, you're sort of having an experience with the with the, with the text, but you're also kind of experiencing this other thing. Mm -hmm. I know it had happened with me when I saw Knocked, I was like obsessed with the surtitles <laughs> and I was like, I love them, you know? Uh, so yeah, I just, I just find the multiple languages that are at work uh, from a technical level and a formal level really exciting. Um, and can I and say also, I am. absolutely, please do, yeah. please, please. Well, I would like to add because for our, us, the situation is extremely interesting. Because if we play in Frisian or if we uh, and there is Dutch sur subtitles, we have like a lot of ways to use it. We have been developing it for years because we work always with all those languages and we have to. So we had Google Glasses, there were like the surtitles, the titles in the uh, scenography that you kind of really find a way to fit it in and that it, it's more um, yeah, living in it, living in yes. your scenography, but also a way with in-ears where there's somebody live translating. So that is more also um, like gebarentop, um, what is it? Somebody who, so it's like a, really a live performance also in the language. So the, the oh, person- that Oh, the interpreter, the live yeah, interpreter. interpreter. Yeah, yeah, but then with the live language, uh, um, with improvisation shows, uh, for instance. Um, but what we, what we really see is that if there are languages that are not equal, for instance, Frisian is not been spoken by so many people as Dutch, uh, the Frisians really don't like it when there's there are Dutch surtitles in their play, and if they are um, have to look at it because it feels like it makes their language less important, or as if it's kind of 
yeah, they, they find it struggling. And I find, find it something so interesting. Then that's also why we work with the ears because only the people who need it can have the ears. Mm. This nice. is fascinating. Yeah. This is this is. Uh, I'm so glad we so we, we know we naturally brought uh, are brought to this sort of because of course the digital opens the easiness of caption. You said mm -hmm. it, you know, Anna. It's so easy to caption, but there is for multilingual theater making. In my head first thing that opens up is straight away. So therefore, we are making the multilingual theater intelligible. Therefore, you know, we're giving into that monolingual need to understand every word. And I'm going to quote Ian Lawrence here from the Need Company, from uh, from Flemish Need Company, who said to me that surtitles are the failure. The, the, the moment surtitles start, it's the end of multilingual theater. <laughs> so just to put that perspective here. And then the other thing is because, of course, we have artists that come from all over the world, captions are accentish. So they recognize very well British accent, standard American, but they work with Eastern European, they work really badly. To the extent when I was trying to caption myself on Zoom uh, and I was watching TV, which I forgot, the Zoom was picking up the BBC and was just completely ignoring me. So, <laughs> so it's, um, or if it was translating me, it was doing things that I have not said, things I'm not, things I have not said. Uh, so I wonder, like, you know, if you have any experience of that, any thoughts, or you want to just counter argument and subtitles are the best thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a quick thought. And, and I loved what Tatiana said about sort of being mindful about which language what might end up suggesting that the, the language of the other group is lesser. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot because you know, I mean, obviously, in Mimi's suitcase, uh, you know, 80% the narrator speaks in English, but every, every time we change countries, we hear the language of that country. Mm. So, you know, when we're in Iran, we hear Persian, when we're in Spain, we, we hear Spanish, and so on and so forth. But I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, what happens if you then take this show, let's just say to Catalonia in Spain. Mm. Now, should, the, should then the primary translation be in Castilian Spanish or in Catalan? Because then you are then narrowing the focus to, right, to gear to the needs of that community, particularly with all the political things that are happening and, and so on and so forth. But then what happens with a multilingual production like, like this um, is that do you, then every, do you then have multiple translations so that as the show is traveling, you then, you know, uh, target uh, a specific, mm -hmm. for example, if this were to be performed in, in France, should the, uh, sh should, should the super titles be in French? Because obviously if they're in English, we're, we're obviously assuming that English mm -hmm. is the, the, the most important the language. language. Exactly, the language, and that everyone should necessarily dominated uh, and we, so that's really interesting because then you start getting into this whole thing about you know wh when is the end there could be no end you know if you're going to have several translations and several versions so it's on the one hand it's super interesting linguistically speaking um, because as you also said sometimes you know translating particularly with um, proverbs for example that right that's just really really tricky and also delicious for a translator to to tackle right so then it just becomes really really interesting linguistically um, this just this was just a thought mm. yeah. Lara uh, yeah I'm thinking about it because um we we did a show um called Poker Face it was a Czech play and uh, in 2017 and uh, we wanted there was the the character of this old kind of patriarch of the family and we really were adamant that we wanted a czech actor uh or and the guy was supposed to be over well over 70 uh, we couldn't find in london a an old czech actor we just tried putting on spotlight we couldn't find it so um we like my my my, my associate director. She uh, she gr grew up artistically in the Czech Republic, so uh, she had this uh, actor there, older actor who, and we said, okay, we're gonna film him in the Czech Republic. We're gonna have him on film because it's a, it was a memory. Uh, he could only speak Czech, so we had him speaking Czech, and and we subtitled him. And I've always thought that it was. The weakest part of the show in a way because i mm. i felt that starting a show with subtitles really bothered me 
uh, in terms of like the first thing that, you know, the audience comes in, it's a video. And actually the guy was amazing, you know, like it was this kind of amazing face. And, and I've always, uh, still now, you know, because we are thinking of redoing it, wonder how uh, is there a, a different way to, to do the subtitles? Because if it felt like, people were just reading and they were not looking at anything else. And, and, and they were actually losing the amazing expressions. And, and sometimes I wonder, do we just leave it as it is and people guess? And if they don't understand anything, then, then you know, by the, by the end of the show, they would understand the beginning of the show. Um, and we did yeah. tour it. And every single time we actually translated into the language of the country where we where we went so when we did it in Italy and we translated him into Italian um but I thought I I mean I I don't know I love multilingualism in a way I want almost to trust the audience and to let them guess what's being said mm -hmm. and and let them be the acting kind of uh, suggest it rather than having all these things to read uh I think it's different if you go and see a show from another country and from beginning to end you don't know what it is about mm. i think that's that's a completely different experience like subtitles when you watch a foreign film but in multilingual shows um i don't i don't know i'm still i'm still trying to to think how can we do that scene <laughs> because i i would like to get rid of the subtitles personally um but that i think is because i have such you know such a physical approach to theater that for me having to read it it, it kind of uh it attracts maybe somehow. the the ear thing will work because then you have one ear where you hear your own uh, language but with the other ear you yeah. hear the language on stage and you can also see the actors that would be actually very interesting yeah mm -hmm. it sounds very very interesting it would be a very interesting uh compromise in a way yeah no you're right you're right yeah i i love how the discussion shows how you know but opening it to someone both in terms of you know actors work, theater makers working, Kari, that you said that Wi-Fi is by itself not accessible to everyone. And at the same, by captioning, we're open to someone, we're cutting someone out. Uh, that complexity uh, that comes out in particular in multilingual theater um, and those political social limitations you all spoke about, um, that is really fascinating. So I wonder what new emerged. So like new, it can be a new tool, aesthetic practice. Um, new is the is the is the keyword here. Uh, in terms of multilingual theater making, for you that you will continue uh, to take on a journey with you, whether theater is making physical spaces and you are actually there face to face, or whether it is a virtual. I can get started if you want. Um, you know, I, I've been working on this other true story, other story of immigration from Poland to Canada, true story um, surrounding uh, the most famous ballad uh, in, in Poland, Bal Ustarego Joska is called. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, you know, if, if before the pandemic, I was already, thinking about the marriage of theater and film, which is something that I feel very passionately about because, you know, as a child, we had, my father had a super eight camera. So we were always playing around. And, and also my father's love of, of cinema because my father was an actor and, and a filmmaker. And, you know, growing up in that milieu, I, I mean, I, I can't help but love so much theater as much as, as much as film. And, and now that the pandemic has happened to answer your question, I'm thinking, um, about not only continue to explore the idea of what Kaidat said about green screen or, or non-green screen, but just, just combining camera and you know, physical theater, multilingual performances, uh, but also uh, audio. You know, I, also, I also love the idea of working with audio and sound effects and, and sort of really recreating a world through, through audio. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the, the things that I personally would, would want to continue exploring uh, beyond the pandemic, because uh, my thing is, is that I, you know, when, you, when you invest so much time and energy in creating a story, obviously you want the story to be heard and seen. And so if reaching larger audiences worldwide mm -hmm. is, is a goal, then, perhaps involving technology might help in that. Mm. 
in that goal. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll say something. Um, I think, yeah, even before, uh, 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 I can repeat things that have been said, but even before the pandemic, we've always, we had already started exploring how to use multimedia in, in theater to, to open up possibilities, like in the case of this, you know, uh, Czech actor, for instance. So, you know, like this, the screens, you know, the live screens, and yes, it's so depending on, on, on Wi-Fi, but um, I, I think it is something that moving forward, we are already thinking of, of including, like for instance, if we are, we are kind of uh, debating doing an adaptation to physical stage of some of the monologues of things I'm not, but it, if we were thinking, you know, obviously who can produce a show with 10 people is very, very expensive. So can we actually retain some of these digital elements and have three people in the space and other people on screen, you know, for instance, that telling their stories in a different, in a different way. So, and you can even rotate if you, if, if you want, but, you know, so that you don't have to actually, you know, have a cast of, 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 of 10 people in a physical space, which for, for a small company, it's, in, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous cost. Uh, so I, I, and also again, you know, how can you have people from, from different countries collaborating and, 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 and even, and some of them being in a physical space and some of them being in a digital space. And I, I think stuff like that will definitely, I think, stay and, and it should be explored more. I, and I, I hope that that's going to happen. Uh, I'll jump in and say that I feel like uh, echoing some of the sentiments already stated. I also want to say that, uh, that for me, thinking a lot about uh, accessibility on all fronts, uh, and especially think a lot, thinking a lot about how we're uh, continuing to make space for and hold space for disabled artists mm. uh, and acknowledging visible and invisible disabilities uh, is something that is really at the forefront of my mind. Um, and so uh, it's, it's something that I think we need I'm not going to, it's hard to use the word we, but I feel like the industry, I'll say the industry, the industry <laughs> needs to um, absolutely reckon with. Um, and, and I feel like it's a, it's a conversation that gets pushed to the side and to the margins over and over and over again, um, including in the language that's being used to return, the return to theater, the return to in-person work. And, um, and, and I feel like a lot of artists in the disability arts uh, communities have felt uh, to a small degree uh, finally included <laughs> in conversations uh, and, and suddenly feeling like they're going to be excluded all over again. So I think that that's very much on my mind and thinking about ways of making work that allows for uh, and holds space for um, uh, the, uh, those artists among us. Um, also, you know, I work as a translator and also as a playwright, so I'm constantly thinking about <laughs> the negotiation of languages on, on stage and uh, the ways of thinking about theater, really, uh, because when you're translating, you're thinking about how does this, especially if you're not translating yourself, which I also do, <laughs> uh, which is how is this artist thinking about theater, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just a word exchange. Uh, and so, so thinking, what does the theater mean, right? And this is this is sort of at the root question. I think that one of the fascinating things about this moment is that it's thrown that question up uh, into the air again um, for wonderful, juicy debate. Uh, and and I think it's a debate that need always be there. Do you know what I mean? I think instead of uh, being in a habitual mode, which I don't think uh, anyone in this room is, but I, but I feel like some people are out there in the industry in habitual kind of, this is the way we quote, this is the way we do things. And, and I'm right, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking, well, why, <laughs> why is this the way we do things exactly? You know, and what I also will say is that I'm, I've been really interested in the conversations around architecture and game design and, uh, game design, story design in relationship to theater making, uh, or hybrid theater making. Uh, and, and what that opens up, uh, especially because there are a lot of audiences um, that feel more comfortable in those realms, actually, that that is actually their, their go-to language, as it were, uh, 
they think and portals and hyperlinks and you know things opening up and but also the idea of like that the game is the space that they're uh, participant in uh, and I think that again thinking about uh, habituation like thinking about like how in some realms of the industry there is this, this ossified idea of what participation means uh, so ideas around co-creation uh, is something that I'm that's kind of opened up uh, at least for me uh, more uh, in terms of this time that we're in and hopefully the future something came to my mind sorry Tatiana before I come to you but something yeah. came to my mind about what Kari that said and what we spoke about earlier on about sort titles and now the disability I think something that has for me came up in terms of both of those issues is that heightened presence, high emphasized presence of the sign language interpreter. So in a sense, making quite a lot of productions multilingual in that sense, because normally, you know, very often we put sign language interpreter somewhere in the corner there, you know, just don't interrupt. Um, but actually now they are very much at the forefront and there was quite a lot of performance activity coming out of the sign language and how exciting the language is so that perhaps that's another way of you know negotiating with the subtitles and i would love to see you know multiple sign language in each corner it's, yes. it's uh, wouldn't that be wonderful yes. sorry i had to share that Tatiana. <laughs> i don't really have something to say or <laughs> No, that's cool. It, it, it didn't have to. So is there anything that you'd be bringing forward in theater that was taken from the pandemic? No, because it's typically the way we work. We always work with a lot of real people from everywhere. And we always try to be very intergenerational. And um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so it's it's it, it was just a... Uh, uh, it was what we always do, but then in a different way. I like how, because you say about the Nacht, that Nacht was performed COVID proof. And in a sense, the theater itself was COVID proof because of the way you work with your community. Yeah, the fun thing is in the Netherlands, every all the theater companies had big problems because they were playing in the theater, but we always play everywhere. We play in um, restaurants, in um, uh, big, yeah, ev everywhere. Sports, sport places, everywhere schools so for us there there was not we we are uh, used to be flexible in that sense yeah thank you that is amazing because i think that's a lesson it's it's in a sense answers what that yeah what caridad was saying about is there is that link mm -hmm. that that there is yeah, a way we, to rethink and you know, we always say we come close i i also i don't feel as, uh, inspired by working in a black box because i want to meet people i want to and see what's happening around and that that inspires inspires me and not a black box i don't want to be uh, out of life and say something of, about life i want to be in life and experience life yeah that is amazing way uh, to say thank you to you and invite uh, anybody from the audience present if they have any question if you have any question you just need to raise your hand and i will unmute you uh, but uh, I'm just looking if there are any questions, but this is this is a wonderful way to powerful way to finish so uh, that you know being in life. Um, so I don't see any questions. So thank you so much uh, for this wonderful inspiring. Um, you know, mind opening uh, panel um, and for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Gracia, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye.